Okay, a special day at the Woodland Escape today. I've got a couple of guests here today. I've got Chris Johnson, I've got Bo Beckett, and uh, one, one fellow who couldn't make it was uh, Ryan um, Belanger, and he, uh, he sent me a hammer in lieu of that. And uh, that's one fine gift. He says he doesn't want any money for it, but that's the kind of um, items that the, these gentlemen make. So in any trade, you've got an apprenticeship period, you've got, you, you become a journeyman, and ultimately you become a master. And these guys are gonna probably shake their heads when I say they are masters, but I'm at the apprenticeship level. And, and it's gonna be a real learning day for me. And, and one of the ways we can do this is to actually immerse ourselves into the 18th century. So no modern facilities like we'd have in, in other types of shops. And we're going to try to create, and we have a classic example here. And this is an original pipe tomahawk ox from um, circa 1820 um, from the Manitoba area, Fort Gary. And we're gonna reproduce these today. And a little bit later, Bo's gonna talk about some of the materials. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna be learning, so I'm gonna be sort of in the backdrop and uh, watch these gentlemen perform their magic. Anyway, welcome, sir. Glad to have you here, Bo. Thanks, Peter. A pleasure, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. Let's get at it. So, so what Chris is wor working on here is uh, these gentlemen arrive, and I'm going to end up at the end of this uh, this uh, weekend uh, having a whole bunch more tools, but they don't like mine. So uh, what are you making there, Chris? I'm just making you a coal rake that's a little bit finer than the one you've got. The one you've got's a little bit heavy duty, so we'll so. clean this up and make it look a little bit uh, uh, less uh, standard stock and put some texture to it, and hopefully, yes. hopefully it will feel a little better in the hand. Hmm. Thought mine a bit crude, did you? A little bit. Huh. Like I said, I'm going to have a whole bunch of tools at the end of this week. You just keep making me tools. I like it. So before we get into watching these gentlemen actually create this, uh, these pipe axes, and they, they might let me bang it once or twice, right? <laughs> sure. With their guidance. But uh, so I have a musket in here. It's it's in for repairs. It it needs some parts made for the for the lock system on. But it's an octagon barrel. It's fairly small caliber, 45, I believe. And uh, maybe you guys can talk a bit about how we could take this and make, uh, wherever it is, the uh, pipe axe. Yeah. Well, one of the methods that they used to use to make these tomahawks is reuse old gun barrels. So we've got a couple pieces of, of material here, uh, a round tube, um, and we've got the hex one, which Peter's gun right there is hex. So we're going to try two different methods and work uh, through the, the process on making both of these into, into pipe tomahawks. Now, this is just, um, this would have been wrought iron, um, so it wouldn't have been very hard. So we'll have to weld in a, a bit of some sort. So they would save any kind of carbon steel they came across and reuse it in tools or axes or whatever. Um, this is an old spring steel. This is an old file. Uh, and this is carbon steel, which I've prepped here. So that'll probably be a bit for, for one of these axes. So, and, and how, Chris, you were talking earlier about how they made carbon back in the day, because they didn't know about modern steels. Metallurgy was in its infancy stage. Prior, so. prior to steel mills making tool steel, they would have made uh, blister steel. So they would have packaged uh, wrought iron into an airtight container with uh, uh, carbon material, like a, like a plant material or something that would have a lot of carbon in it, and they would put that in the fire, and I think they would bake it for like, uh, overnight even, uh, in order to get these crude high carbon blister steel. Hard, hardening it. Yeah, and that's how they would make fire strikers and the, um, the striker on your, on your gun as well. Perfect, interesting. Well, are we ready to start forming a pipe? Yep, let's okay. get started. Perfect. So this is the, the round gun barrel. We're gonna put this up on, onto the hardy and we're gonna do a neck on it. We'll go ahead. Okay. 
So this is something that none of us have tried before. This is all new to us making pipe tomahawks, so it's a bit of an experiment. Um, we've all done axes and, and uh, hawks before, but never the pipe tomahawk. So um, doing it with this gun barrel is gonna be interesting to see which method works best and how to, how to make these in the future. Okay, so let's move on to the, the hex. So we've, we've got a good start here on, on both the round pipe. This one's gonna be a little delicate. Um, th they did make them. There's but, just not as much material in Right. This. So I'm going to get into a wee bit of history of both the axe uh, in a little bit. Because uh, I like to watch guys work. I can talk. You guys can work. I kind of like that. Uh, <laughs> but we got a good start here for, for sort of the junction of the bowl to where we're going to flatten it for the eye and then split it to form the axe head. So we're, we're coming along there. Good job, guys. So Kathy's built us this fine potato leek soup for three hungry blacksmiths. If I can get them away from the anvil for a few minutes, uh, we're going to load up here and uh, get back at it here shortly. Mm. Hey, cheers. A toast to uh, pipe tomahawks. Cheers. Cheers. So there's, there's something uh, pretty special, at least for me, to hold something that's 200, perhaps 200 plus years old. And at one point it was a working tool. Uh, and I'm, I have to give a shout out to my good friend Jerry Neelans. Uh, he has a, a web page group uh, called Portraying Natives in the War of 1812. And, and I'm pretty sure that for every hour I sleep, Jerry researches. <laughs> the guy's madly uh, and nuts about finding out these little tidbits and, and he shares it on this group. So it's, it's worth, worth checking out. So in the research that Jerry supplied us, and which I forwarded to both Chris and Bo, uh, were measurements, uh, photographs, uh, historic documents, and, and the list goes on. Um, so the word tomahawk um, is an Algonquin word meaning to knock down. So it was a weapon. And, and they, the Stone Age people, of course, but once we had European contact, they quickly made the shift to steel, minus, minus the, uh, the bolt, of course. But at some point, someone decided, well, they could combine the natives' love for smoking uh, with a, a tool, which could be used for, both for work or, or as a weapon. And, uh, and anyway, thanks very much, Jerry, for, for all you've done to help us. But just a, a few bits. This, this particular axe, it, it, there's sort of an evolution. Um, so prior to the Rev War, um, they were smaller, shorter, more defined. Some of them very ornate. So they're presented to affluent chiefs and um, war chiefs or for, to acquire trading rights with certain nations. But around the Rev War or so, they're, they're replaced with what they call the, we'd call this the Regency, I believe is the name that they use. Um, the trade or the building of these sort of ends shortly after the War of 1812, maybe into the 1830s, 20s, 30s, and, and then it's gone. But for about 50 years, this would have been a very common um, tool or, or gift, a trade item on, on the frontiers or, or in the New World. So I don't normally do this, but I've taken some of Jerry's notes because I find it quite quite fascinating. One of the um, the things we know is that for the most part, these were shipped from either France or, or England, um, but they started to make them uh, to some degree in in North America. So local blacksmiths and gunsmiths would start to produce these, but they never came quite up to the native standards, and, and they were particular and. As trading partners, they had to sort of appease or, or give the natives what they wanted. So the quality tools went up. England was making good quality tools. 
Uh, an example is the trade muskets, so the Northwest trade gun. There's a side plate on that particular gun, and they made hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these guns were shipped to North America. And they had a serpent on it. But for some reason, very early on, even the early trade muskets, before the Northwest trade musket, they wanted that serpent. So Jerry sent a note. I'm not sure who, who wrote this quote, but it was in terms of procuring these by local smiths, such as we're doing today, locally, and, and it, it, they're quite thorough. It says, the same form precisely must be used for the pipe, eye, blade, and the pipe must be made in the solid and not screwed, brazed, or welded. So in other words, it would be quite a bit easier, I think I'll get your ideas, guys, from a blacksmithing perspective, yeah. to tap and drill that thing and screw it in, or braze it on. But that wasn't, the natives weren't gonna have anything to do with that. He continues by saying, uh, so that they will stand the knocks, which is required they should often give. The blade must be well tempered and steeled so it can carry a good edge. The thickness and weight nearly as possible, similar to the model and ornamentation part equally the same. So yeah, we're <laughs> we're gonna do that, right guys? That's what we're doing today. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna create that. So, so the natives would buy our product, right? Or we, we could trade. Anyway, that's my wee bit of history, and I'm holding these guys up. I, I, I can feel the tension. So at the commencement of this construction, we're doing what, what has been a time-honored tradition with the first peoples on this continent for centuries. And, and that's using, they had four sacred plants, so sweet grass, cedar, sage, and tobacco. Tobacco being the more ceremonial of them. And they would often leave offerings if they were to harvest a tree, um, it gave thought to bring them good luck. So in the process, we we're going to follow that tradition. And, and you may think as Europeans that it's something that we wouldn't do, but history would show that the French voyageurs, for example, when they pitched off from Montreal for the lakehead and Lake Superior, they put a, a, a sprinkling of tobacco on the water to hopefully bring them luck on their passage. So we're, we're going to follow that tradition as we make these native um, trade items. All right. And I should point out that that, uh, that tobacco was prepared by the, um, some friends of yours. First Nations near, um, near Perry Sound, Wasoxing First Nation. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Here's to good luck with their hawks. Mm -hmm. So what Chris and... Uh, and Bo are doing it this morning. Yep, let's flip it. They're driving the slot through to start forming the eye for the for the wooden shaft. Yeah, we're through. And we're through. Yeah. Perfect. So the part we were just doing there, um, Chris and Bo are, are drifting the eye. And so these this set of drifts um, Bo made for me, it's making me a third one, right? Yeah. For a slightly bigger ax. But I should point out that most of the tools that you see in this shop, and it's, they've grown exponentially, um, are made by these two fellows. They, they, they don't buy their tools, they, they, they make them. This is a, these are gonna work out very well yeah. for me, Bo. Yeah, appreciate that. I think a lead ball is going to go through that anymore. <laughs> so what, what Bo's doing is flattening this portion of the, of the gun barrel down to take a slot so he can basically punch out the eye for the, for the shaft as well.
So this was the round tube. Um, it's working out pretty well. I've, uh, I've slid it here and then we've spread it open uh, with the drift. I have a little bit more drift work to do um, and then I'll start working on, on this end. It's turning out a little bit smaller just because the material wasn't there to um, make it as large as we'd expected. So that, that Jerry's research is re really pays off. So there we have a 200 plus year old tomahawk, smoked tomahawk. And there's a template that we used using Jerry's measurements. So you can see it's, it's pretty darn close. Now, Bo, Bo pointed out that, that his is smaller. Well, if we go back to early days, a lot of the, these weren't tools as much as they were ceremonial gifts. So there were smaller pipe pots. Keep bear in mind, this is the Regency War of 1812 kind of era. And prior to the Revolutionary War, they were smaller. But uh, thanks again to Jerry, because your measurements are spot on to the original. Pretty darn close, Chris. I think uh, now she's getting off close to filing time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's ready for the for the bit in there. So we're just adding some borax to make the weld. Okay. We'll put it back in and heat up. So this is the bit of tool steel. Okay, so the, what the borax does is it it uh, it creates this almost little glass coating over top of the steel, so that uh, the steel doesn't oxidize. Because if that oxidation gets in between the two plates that you're trying to weld, um, it doesn't stick. So that that borax um, just is like a, a, a surface to protect it from that that oxidation. That side looks good. Okay, so we're looking for the metal to be the same color as the background fire, almost white, and the flux to start run um, to liquefy on the surface. What we don't want to see is sparks, then we'd be too hot for the tool steel. So now we're going to trim off all this extra material and then file it and then clean it up.
I'm going to take a bit of a break from blacksmithing here and talk about one of our most uh, avid followers since Kathy and I started the Woodland Escape. And her name's Marie and she comes from Quebec. And she's never failed to comment on one of her videos and every one of them is a thought-provoking exercise in philosophy and, well, all kinds of stuff. And the last one she sent I thought was really appropriate. I thought I'd read it. So uh, Edwin Markham was an American poet, I think early 1900s. And he says, for all the people and meet them ever alike, when you are the anvil bear and when you are the hammer strike. And I, I thought that was appropriate to talk about today. Okay, we're, we're getting awful close now. We've got, uh, and, and you can see that the, the one we made with the, um, the, the bigger one is pretty much using the template that Jerry sent us is pretty darn close to, to the original one. Um, and like I mentioned before, here's the one we're working on the filing process now. Uh, pipe has to be shortened a wee bit to make it symmetrical. Um, or more in scale. Uh, but just a thought on tomahawks. If you think about it, it, it they're a complete dichotomy. You have, on, on one end, you've got a symbol of war. It could be used as a tool, but mostly it was used as, as a weapon. And on the other end, you've got a symbol of peace. So we have this unique item that was, um, was quite popular in the New World for approximately 50 years, maybe a little over 50 years till it went out of favor. Uh, and that old term, bury the hatchet. So when you had antagonists that would battle in war with one another, when they buried the hatchet, they were sort of saying, it's all over, I'll never take up arms against you again. So a pretty unique piece. And, and as far as the smoking part, ceremonial for natives, of course. And, and uh, this would be shared at councils, at uh, treaty signings, and, and that sort of thing. So anyway, we're darn close to finishing. So we've spent a day and a half in the forge and we've got um, three tomahawks roughly forged out. And this is when the real work begins, uh, you know, a day and a half here and then probably a week or more in finishing uh, filing, polishing, engraving, um, then putting a handle together. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll get the handles roughed out to send home with you. And uh, then we'll wait for uh, footage of the finished products. Yep. So what we're going to do next is we're going to temper this blade. Um, we're going to bring a large chunk of steel out of the fire, lay it on the anvil red hot, and rest the, uh, the blade on top of it. And we're going to see this thing start to change color. And we're going to watch those temper colors run out to the blade. And when we get a straw color out on the edge of the blade, we're going to plunge it in water and arrest the tempering process at that point. And that should give us um, a blade that's, that's hard, but... Um, still durable, tough. Um, when you've quenched, it's brittle. Once we've tempered, it becomes tough and a usable tool. All right, so that's just starting to turn a gold. It'll turn purple if we leave it any longer. We'll put that right in the water. Okay, Chris, Chris and Bo have worked their magic and uh, we've got a beautiful bronze yellow color right out to the cutting edge so it's tempered well and, and now a whole lot of filing and finish work and that's going to be a fine piece. Well, my friends, this has been an absolute yeah. hoot. I, I, I can't thank you yeah, enough. Thanks. It was wonderful. Good to meet you too, Bo. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, these funny two got to meet. They've been yeah, friends yeah. of mine for a while, but now they're together. Bo and I go back a long time. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we won't talk about how long. Um, anyway, I should point out that in my blacksmith shop, I'm an apprentice. These guys, like I said, are the masters. They've really taught me a lot um, this weekend, um, but they make their living at it. So I'm going to put some links down below and they make some crazy good stuff and you should check them out. So anyway, thanks again, guys. Yep, thank thanks you. Thanks for having us. It's been a pleasure. Perfect. <laughs>